che mai luna mai è. Ona mea ona no e au, ona mele. What is the Hawaiian worldview? All indigenous peoples have world views and they're all not the same. Value is universal, but how you put it into action is going to de be dependent upon their world view. Okay? So when I talk about Hawaiian world view, I'm thinking of that framework. Now, why is that connected and important? I connect it with social work. In the 1960s, we came across situations with our families that we worked with, that they talked about behaviors and patterns and beliefs that created pilikia in their ability to get along with each other and with society around. Their choices, their decision often landed them in the statistics. And when a family came to a worker and said, our family has been cursed. Huh. If they're only statistics, we take them on. But if they've been cursed, yeah, or if they saw ghosts, and if they had spooky dreams, our schooling did not include any of that. Our schooling in a Western setting talked about theories and translated it into ways of working with the families in understanding them, in analyzing situations. They came from a Western framework. Is that going to fit for the Hawaiian? It doesn't. And so, social workers at the Children's Center, Queen Liliuokalani Children's Center, learned with Tutu Mary Kavenapukui. What was the Hawaiian family's worldview? And I'd like to share that with you. I selected the Kumulipo as one Hawaiian framework. I've selected Kanaka Lens as another Hawaiian framework. I've selected Kuenhina as another framework that are based in written documentation in the chants that go way back. The Kumulipo is the one that connects us with our beginnings all the way back to the gods. The Ko'ihonua links me back to my ancestors, to Vakea, Ho'ohoku Kalani, and Ho'ohoku Kalani's mother, Papa. The beginnings of the Hawaiian worldview. The Kumulipo also has sections that talk about the birth and the creation of ocean creatures that have its counterpart on land. So what we find in the ocean we find on land. Okay. 
So those who are striving to develop and expand on their mo'oku au hau, your family genealogy, many are able to go back to Vakea ho'ohoku kalani and from ho'ohoku kalani to papa. They've completed it. Others are not so lucky. And those that come to the attention of social workers, chances are probably not the ones that know their mo'oku au hao. They become disconnected. Yeah. And so, in the Kumulipo, they have identified ways in which to help those of us living today to reconnect with our past. One is with the mo'oku au hao that helps with our identity. It helps us to make some decisions that allow us to respect and bring honor to our family name and our ancestors. The, the birth of creatures in the ocean and creatures on land, that's the plants, the animals, and the birds. Reminds us of duality. Ocean and land. Yeah? Reminds us of north and south, east and west, opposites. So if there is disharmony, we know the opposite of that is pono, to be in balance, to have harmony. So there's an indication. There's always a solution. You never left that way. So you look for that pathway that can bring you back to balance. Okay. So duality is important. Kuenhina. Kuenhina, according to Tu, before they got elevated to the godliness, were husband and wife, and they came from, and when she says Kahiki, it's from the land far away, no specific place. And she said, Kuenhina represent opposites. For example, in your body, ku is on the right side, hina is on the left side. When I was first hapai, and as I, I was hapai with twins, so oh, my opu was kind of big, so my parents and my in-laws, uh, the mothers especially, they're watching. I think going to be girl. No, 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 I think going to be boy. Because she do everything with the right hand. <laughs> the right hand is strong, going to be boy. And when I went hanao, it was girls. <laughs> but they still recognize this is male. This is female. In healing, okay. Hawaiians recognized there's external treatment, internal treatment, the opposites. And with external treatment, pick with the right with the left. You pick with the left. 
for internal treatment, it's the use of the right. Okay. So, if one is going out in the environment to gather la'au, if it is for internal treatment, you go when the sun is beginning to rise and you pick with your right hand. And you've got enough time to get back before high noon. If you're doing for external, you pick with the left. And you have time to prepare. Okay. So again, this notion of opposites. Our alignment of our body is made visible by our shadow. In the morning when the sun is coming up, the shadow is on the right. In the afternoon, as the sun begins to set, the shadow comes out on this side. But at high noon, kau kala ikalolo, ku shadow recedes into the body and joins with hina who is already here, when the sun begins its journey above the head, Hina's shadow begins to leave, and you can see it on the ground. Hawaiians believe at high noon, the powers of Ku and Hina in unity is strong power. It is a time to have your ceremonies. It is a time for sacred rites to begin. In my husband's um, teaching of Lua, it is the recognition among the Lua warriors and the Haumana that when they do sacred ceremony, it's either kaukala kalolo or it's at midnight. And it's dependent on where the moon is. And for sacred ceremonies regarding treatment and healing, it's very important that you recognize when this concept plays an important role. Um, when we've done Ho'oponopono, Pilikia is really deep and it is pervasive. And it cannot take one time. It takes several times. Protocol and ritual define levels of expectations and accomplishments. So the ritual makes known you have reached this stage. It also makes known what has been accomplished. So if the pilikia has been worked through, it has been worked through. But it also identifies in the modern way what efforts were taken to bring this about. And at this point, being involved in a puni ritual solidifies it because that puni ritual includes acknowledgement with the higher spirits, the spirits of that healing practice. 
and it involves individuals. It involves individuals to make it happen in a cognitive way. Because once you release in a punny ceremony, it can never be brought up again. So what does the punny ceremony consist of? It is the preparation of selected foods representative of the gods. It's presented and portion and it's cooked. It's offered its essence to the gods and the powers that be. And then the leftover foods are eaten by the participants. <clears throat> the Pani ceremony can also include rituals of cleansing so that after you've eaten these foods you clean your body and you wash it away <coughs> in our sessions i believe we're going to be able to cover some of that because these practices are part of learning how to care for yourself so that when you get involved with that, you are saying, I am fully in, I'm fully compatible, and I honestly and genuinely engage in what I'm doing that symbolizes my release, letting go, and my okay to cut. So it's not just somebody telling you to okay, but you're involved in that process because kapukai requires you to do your own pule. One of the things that we've done sometimes with kids is um, this activity of um, perspectives and truth and um, we often ask them describe what you see the other side another person describes what they see but it may be different if you have a book the front cover is different from the back cover but their story is different but it is their truth because they're saying exactly what they see so, it emphasizes honoring perspectives. My husband with the men will always say to them, I have a stack of Bibles here. I want you to come over here and can you put your hand on the Bibles and swear that is your truth. That's another level. What their perspective is, is from the human domain. But when he asked them to put the hand on the Bible, that is getting inside of them and forcing them to reckon with the higher power they believe in. So ritual is so powerful, but you cannot use it for everything, to solve everything without going through the proper process. Okay. So that's what I mean by form and essence. Yeah. So spirituality is a very important part. The po'o is the seat for your family spiritual guardians to be able to join you. The Pico is the one that connects you with the living Ohana. This one connects you with the deceased Ohana. 
the genitalia connect you with the future ohana. When all of this has been righted and is pono, balance and in harmony, then you are said to be in alignment. Yeah. The na'au is your guide that tells you, am I being genuine or am I going through the motions? Yeah. So, our Hawaiian worldview acknowledges plants around are spiritual in nature. They have a spiritual component. Many of them are kinolau of our gods. So that they're always reminders of us, of our worldview, the kalo out there, representing haloa. But from haloa, you go up to Haloa Naka to Ho'ohoku Kalani and Vakea, from Ho'ohoku Kalani to Papa. So they're there. Yeah. The tea leaf. Kinolau of the gods. So spirituality is the domain that permeates all of the Hawaiian life. And so the teachings of getting along and of loving and of giving, being generous, of being courageous to step up to the front to protect what you value and you love. They're all built into that. Genuineness is a reflection of you're in alignment with the spiritual powers. Yeah. So all of those terms that talk about how you relate to other people are the action words that promote interrelationships and interdependence. As much as you are hospitable and you're generous with your ohana, they can return like kind to you. And so the worldview is based upon this give freely, unconditional, because when you need, it's going to come back. It's based on malama, taking care, not just yourself, but your relatives around you and all the kinolau and the plants that is about you. Hawaiians are not perfect. Um, on Kauai about maybe 15 years ago, in an excavation being done in Mahaule Pu on Kauai. Dr. William Kikuchi, in his excavations, um, came across chicken bones that were huge. And he looked at this and he said, look at the chicken bones. But he said, when he put the pieces together, it was chicken bones. And then he remembered, in New Zealand, they have the moa. Moa is chicken. And these moa are big chicken. And they stand very high. So his theory was, in Hawaii, we had moa. But because of uncontrolled consumption, plenty meat, and you offer it to the ali'i, you offer it to the gods. Plenty meat. They didn't know how to incubate. They wiped out the moa. Extinction. So, 
through experience, our people learn. You have to malama and propagate so that you replenish in a sustainable way. Otherwise, it leads to extinction. So it just didn't come to them. They live through these experiences. Yeah. The last thing I want to cover with you is the Kanaka lens. I want you to take a, yourselves on a journey. Let's go up to Palehua. We go through the arid lands, go through the subdivision. The air is turning cooler. And then you have to stop and open the locks as you continue going up. And there's one section where they have a camp or a retreat, but beautifully located. So from that point, you can go even further up to Ka'ala, the highest peak, highest elevation on Oahu. On Palehua, you look to the right, you look to the left. On one side, you might be able to see the ocean. You might be able to see where the land reaches the ocean. That's one boundary. On the other side, at Palehua, you look and you see that plains that lies between the two mountain ranges and beyond the Ko'olau range is ocean again. If you switch your body going north-south and if you're up at Ka'ala, one side you'll see the land meeting the ocean. On the other side, by Haleiwa, land meeting the ocean. And the ocean going beyond that coastal area. And the ocean just goes and goes and goes and you don't know where it stops. That is the Tanaka's worldview. And that world tells, worldview tells them, my island has boundaries. The resources on my island are limited. It doesn't extend because you hit the deep blue water. You've lost navigation. You don't know how to go beyond that. So what does that tell them? They have to malama what they have on land. If they don't malama, it'll become extinct. So that worldview already sets into motion, taking what you need and not raping the resources. And when you gather together, you share what you have harvested because harvesting requires more than one person or one family, requires you to be generous. And if you have an ali'i coming and you have to preserve and have food ready, what do you do? You reserve certain plots of land for the growth of the plant life that you need to be able to make available to the ali'i. You develop fish ponds, or you take advantage of nature's 
curve of the land and you create natural fish ponds that allow the taking of limited amounts of fish so that there's always more. So this idea, harvesting only what you need, being generous with what you get and sharing the notion of having to take care of your resources so that when you need it, it is available. That's all part of the Kanaka worldview. And this attitude has come down to us. Now comes Western civilization. Now comes freezers, refrigeration. Now comes money. So what happens with our interdependence? What happens with our need to make resources continue for those living and for those who are yet to come? There's a break in all of that. Okay. So the Hawaiians' choices were in large part determined by their worldview. Okay. But with the mingling of outside forces, many things went out the window. <laughs>